This country has socialism for the rich and rugged individualism for the poor. End of quote. Welcome to the first in our series on socialism. Now, to do this right, we have to let go of the stories that we tell ourselves. Ask how things came to be. Be curious and scientific, not doctrinal or emotional. For example, if you consider yourself aligned with socialist principles, can you step back and view the marvels a capitalist system has delivered? Can you, as a capitalist, look critically at the harm? Can we ascribe values to these observations and ask whether they reflect standard moral and ethical norms we want reflected in our society? Can we accept that ideals attempting to form a general framework for society cannot be static and must evolve and iterate? At its core, this approach is known as Hegelian dialectic, the study of opposites and constant flow. G.W.F. Hegel, who was the greatest influence on Karl Marx, was himself inspired by the work of the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus, the philosopher behind the notion that no person can step into the same river twice. The river changes. It's in constant flow, and we are as well. The point is, you cannot evaluate a system simply by what it was intended to produce. You must also place a value upon its unintended consequences. Moreover, no system is static. Under capitalism, the world has experienced technological innovations at a rate never before experienced in human history. Medicine, communications, manufacturing, transportation, nearly every element of society the world over has been impacted in a significant way under the system of capitalism. Now along the way, these things have altered the nature of capitalism. Capitalism is a different river and we a different people. But if we're to be true observers, we must ask whether or not capitalism is responsible for such growth and innovation. Would society have developed in such profound ways under another system? All worthwhile questions and pathways. But this is a discussion about socialism. So we have to establish a foundation and some definitions despite the constantly changing nature of systems. And from this foundation, we can develop key questions with the tacit agreement between us that some are unanswerable. But we can take comfort in knowing that a lack of an answer shouldn't frustrate our quest for one. It merely recognizes the river for what it is. Now, the reason I began talking about capitalism is because socialism is fundamentally a critique of capitalism. Most socialist critiques are similar in nature. The variations of socialist ideology come with the prescriptions for evolving beyond capitalism. Laying this out ahead of time has given us an opportunity to be collaborative. And as we go, I'd love to hear your feedback and questions to make sure that we're scratching all of those intellectual itches. To kick things off, I asked members of the Facebook group and the YouTube community to provide a basic definition of socialism as if they were explaining it to a young person. As usual, your responses were wonderful. Here are just a handful to get us started. Nicholas Walton said, socialism is an economic system where the government of a country nationalizes and controls all of its industries. Stephen Whitfield said socialism is the idea of using the government to channel the profit of industry to the benefit of all the citizens that make that industry possible. A government, its citizens, and its businesses must work with one another to function properly. Our Canadian friend Trocution said, I would explain it to my little girl as a government that takes money through taxes and redistributes it back to the people, whether through infrastructure like roads, healthcare, education, or just basic welfare concepts like food and housing. Nathan Shapiro said the equitable sharing of resources in a society to each according to his or her needs. Alex Powers offered that socialism is the abolition of the employer-employee dichotomy in a period in which the state exists not to serve the capitalist class, but the working class, actively confronting the interests of the ruling class. It is the next step on the path to a moneyless, classless, stateless society. Dan Garcia. I must cite David Pakman in explaining what I also believe. Social democracy versus democratic socialism. Similar words in a different order. I feel this needs to be clarified in order to understand the misinformation and demonizing of the term, especially by the right. Democratic socialism is a form of socialism where one seeks to socialize the ownership of the means of production. Social democracy is a highly regulated form of capitalism, like we see in European and Nordic countries. Very different things. Matthew Dwyer said socialism is recognition that some sectors are off limits to the profit motive, full stop. This is just a snapshot of the feedback we received. 
You can hear more on the Companion podcast, but just this small experiment illustrates the challenge in defining something as broad as socialism. In these extraordinary responses, we can begin to understand the complexity of systems design. We heard political and economic themes, concepts like fairness and equity, class struggle, social constructs, corporate systems, issues pertaining to basic rights, civil, human, natural, and legal, expressions of social constructs like dignity and morality, centralized planning, nationalization. These are all aspects of socialism and the duality of defining it as an economic system and an ideology. And there's crossover between the two, with ideological concepts informing economic structures and vice versa. Before we dig into actual definitions and begin to dissect both the economic and ideological frameworks from a historical perspective, let's first look at how socialism is addressed in our current society. Perhaps the best way to do this is to peer through the lens of the mainstream media, which acts as both a reflection of our beliefs and a megaphone. While talking about socialism is no longer as taboo in this nation as it was during the Cold War era, it's still difficult to find honest discourse outside of niche outlets. To demonstrate this, let's first listen to how socialism is spoken about on the establishment liberal mouthpiece, MSNBC. The first clip is from Lawrence O'Donnell, himself a prominent liberal media figure who has publicly stated that he is a socialist, despite his establishment credentials. Socialism in the 1950s in America uh, became a bad word, and, and we then became uh, anti-intellectual about socialism. We as a country stopped thinking about what it actually is and just adopted, for the most part, a posture of fear uh, against the word and the concept socialism. And so, uh, you know, when Medicare uh, was proposed in the 1960s, the argument against it wa was essentially its socialism. That was the entire argument. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of surprising that that argument didn't work, especially because it was true. Medicare is socialism and everyone on Medicare in this country is the beneficiary of a very smart socialistic program called Medicare. This is about as honest an assessment as you'll hear from a mainstream figure on the proverbial left. But even though he's a fixture on MSNBC, this clip is from C-SPAN. I have no doubt that aspects of socialist theory creep into O'Donnell's signature op-eds on his program, but they're certainly not readily accessible. Now, this clip from Chuck Todd, on the other hand, is far more indicative of the manner in which socialism is addressed, even by the supposedly most left-leaning mainstream outlet. Well, that got us thinking about some other isms and its that could use some redefining if being social makes you a socialist. If you look, if you like to commune with people, does that make you a communist? How about if you're into fashion? Are you, a fa are you now a fascist? Perhaps you're left-handed. Guess that makes you a leftist. Or say you're a business person who dictates letters. Dictator, anyone? Aside from the fact that Chuck Todd probably won't be headlining any comedy clubs near you anytime soon, this strikes at the heart of how socialism is generally dismissed, even among liberals. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the constant din of anti-socialist rhetoric in the right-wing media and political ecosystem. If Democrats want to bring socialism to America, it makes me wonder, do they want to destroy America? Billionaire and Home Depot co-founder Bernie Marcus is blasting socialism, rightly so, for making things worse because socialism sucks. One of the most serious challenges our countries face is the specter of socialism. It's the wrecker of nations and destroyer of societies. Capitalism is good because capitalism is freedom. Socialism is bad because socialism is tyranny. Not it's an aspect of tyranny, socialism itself is tyranny. Neither the casual nor devout consumer of mainstream news is ever really confronted with serious dialogue about ideology and political theory. So the information about socialism is just one example, is either delivered in a bemused and dismissive tone on the left or a vituperative tone on the right. It's why Bernie's presidential bids were seismic in terms of the influence on our language and culture. Bernie's steady drumbeat of messages regarding inequality, the 1%, universal health care, and student debt relief were vital. By pointing out the byproducts of a denigrated capitalist system, he was able to open hearts and minds to evaluating other political and economic modalities without the need to expressly criticize capitalism or promote socialism. In fact, I would argue that one of the reasons Bernie's message resonated to the degree that it did is that he never expressly advocated for socialism, 
Even now, past his presidential candidacy years, he's still cautious about the framing of his ideas. His new book, for example, is titled It's Okay to Be Angry About Capitalism, which might be the harshest criticism he's offered. It's not called Capitalism Failed, Death to Capitalism, Down with Capitalism, just It's Okay to Be Angry. But he's particularly good about calling out the people who take advantage of the system. The uber wealthy, the oligarchs, the one percent, millionaires and billionaires. And when he takes capitalism to task, it's usually couched in language that blames the wealthy for corrupting the system, not the system itself. Even his framing as a democratic socialist was a high wire act, one that's actually false. As listener Dan Garcia points out, in the United States, we have the concept of social democracy and democratic socialism backwards. Social democracy, sometimes referred to as market socialism, seeks to construct socialist systems on top of market-based systems that preserves private property, markets to determine price and production, wage labor, and shareholder capital. Democratic socialism, or classical socialism on the other hand, takes a more Marxian approach to organizing economic systems such as labor-owned production and centralized planning. It's not that Bernie was being disingenuous, and I'm not sure how much semantics matter to even the most curious member of the public. I just think that it was far easier to build a national platform around the term democratic socialism, and once it started, it was too late to shift gears. But since we're placing so much emphasis on the importance of language, it's worth making the distinction here. Either way, what Bernie accomplished is not to be understated. Over the past dozen years or so, he has helped mainstream ideas that were the third rail in the U.S., not even discussion in polite company. Stuff that was spoken about on college campuses, and barely so. Maybe incorporated into white papers at left-leaning nonprofits and think tanks. That's why I think he took such a measured linguistic approach, always refraining from stating that capitalism is a failed system, stopping short of calling for a socialist revolution, using terms like uber-capitalism, socialism for the rich, democratic socialism, social safety nets, Scandinavian models, corrupt oligarchy, corporatism, etc. But now that these ideas have once again been released into the wild, and younger generations especially are willing to examine the merit of systems other than capitalism, we've reached an interesting point in capitalist history. Most thinking people understand that what we have now, no matter what you want to call it, capitalism, corporatism, oligarchy, inverted totalitarianism, whatever, it's not working. Inequality is widening. Entire systems keep failing. The pandemic exposed the fragile nature of globalism. And oh, by the way, we're cooking the planet. Strictly speaking of the United States, and this isn't being ethnocentric, just pragmatic, as we remain the key driver of the global economy. The immediate future looks bleak in terms of leadership, with Joe Biden seeking a second term and what is shaping up to be the most evil cast of characters ever assembled running against him. And I get it that it's frustrating and a lot can happen in just a few years. But I truly believe that the 2008 financial crisis, the Occupy movement in 2011, and the rise of Bernie Sanders potentially, emphasis on potentially, ushered us into a new era brimming with opportunity to evaluate the history of economic and social systems in order to design new ones. But as we've said before, how can you know where you're going if you don't know from whence you came? And before we can even get there, we have to know what the hell we're talking about. As we saw with the confusion surrounding social democracy versus democratic socialism, it's important to nail down a few key concepts and terms as we move through this discussion. As we'll cover in upcoming chapters, the language and concepts surrounding socialism have evolved over time. The most enduring contributions to our general understanding, however, come from Karl Marx. So much of what we'll pull from is largely attributed to his work in Das Kapital, the Communist Manifesto, and various other works completed by Friedrich Engels after Marx's death. Importantly, the roots of socialism predate Marx, but one of his great contributions was to define certain ideas and build them into an economic framework. At the time Marx was writing, he viewed the classes in the capitalist system generally as the working class, or the proletariat, and the bourgeoisie. The workers and laborers comprised the proletariat, and the owners of capital, sometimes referred to by Marx as the guardians, were the bourgeoisie. Now, later on, the rise of the service and merchant class, those who stand to profit from trade but still lack the status of a capital guardian, would develop into the petty bourgeoisie. So while it may seem elementary to us today, one of his great innovations was in valuing capital. 
In the simplest of terms, prior to this period, commodities were viewed in terms of their use value, what the raw form of a material is worth. The exchange value is its value in a transaction. Now, prior to Marx defining value in such terms, most models strictly considered use value and attempted to equate quantifiable values between commodities. X amount of corn is worth Y amount of iron, as he proposes in Das Capital. But the process of turning a material into something with an exchange value or a worth in the marketplace involves a degree of labor to transform it from its natural state. As he writes, quote, the value of a commodity, therefore, varies directly as the quantity and inversely as the productiveness of the labor incorporated into it, end quote. So again, sounds super simple, but it's hugely important to understanding the roots of what will ultimately be his critique of the entire capitalist system. By valuing the inputs of labor and crediting this ingredient as that which gives exchange value to a commodity, he makes labor the central economic ingredient of the value of production, or as Marx calls it, quote, incorporating living labor with their dead substance. When we talk about the means of production, another central element to economic theory, we're talking about everything involved in bringing a product to market. Tools to extract raw materials, transport of materials and goods, the equipment used to add value to a raw material. Essentially, everything outside of the raw material and the labor required to convert it into something worthy of an exchange value. And one of the keys to differentiating between capitalism and various forms of socialism is an understanding of private property. Essentially, who owns the means of production? Who owns the tools, the factories, the machines, the transportation, etc.? In a capitalist society, it's pretty straightforward. The guardian class owns the means of production and therefore determines how it's used. In a socialist society, the workers themselves would theoretically own the means of production, thereby stripping the guardian class of such private property. This is one key distinction we can make, for example, between modern social democracy and democratic socialism. The former would still allow for the existence of private property, but utilize state programs of taxation to redistribute the surplus capital derived from production. The latter would flow directly to the working class. Now, all of this paints a small picture within a much larger system. If we jump ahead in our timeline to when the Bolsheviks took control of Russia and attempted to convert from a feudal economy to a collective, the concept was theoretically based on a more democratic, socialist-style economy. The word Soviet is essentially a local democratically elected council that would theoretically determine the governance and economic activities of a defined region. Again, in theory, this democratic process would give ownership and authority to control the economy and grant quasi-ownership of the means of production. The vision of a union of socialists controlling pieces of a large system was the genesis of the Soviet Union. Now, later on, we'll discuss how this concept never came to fruition, but just the idea of it is an approximation historians have to how the working class could own the political and economic process within a larger system. Building on this, the natural question arises of how exactly labor-owned controlled operations would participate in the larger economy and theoretically thrive under a political system. That's where the theories diverge even more. Again, as we'll move through the series, we'll give examples of different interpretations and systems that evolved from attempting to answer questions like this. But for now, we're still in the definitions and level setting phase, so let's continue with a few questions because we can already see how complications would arise along the way to building out a socialist infrastructure, not only within a defined territory, but in terms of how this economic system would fit into a global marketplace. Here are just a few that illustrate the complexity of these theories. If market forces such as supply and demand aren't solely responsible for determining price, then how are goods and services valued? How do you determine output? We're used to the idea that the price of something is what the market will bear or people are willing to pay for it. Under a socialist system, who values the inputs such as labor and even raw materials? If ownership of property and the means of production is distributed among the working class, how do we determine the value of a share? Is skilled labor worth the same as unskilled labor? Where does capital investment come from if not the markets and the bourgeoisie? If surplus value, the amount above the value of labor and material inputs is split among the working class, then how are deficits accounted for? We're conditioned to believe that innovation is fostered by the desire for capital accumulation. 
Under a socialist system, what are the key incentives to innovate if all surplus wealth is distributed evenly? We're also conditioned to believe that scarcity increases value and abundance detracts from it. If scarcity is a market force, then does it still exist in the absence of a free market? Does it even matter? Attempts to answer these and many other questions naturally involve government intervention to a large degree. Some believe that many of these questions are answered with a centralized planning model, whereby outputs are predetermined by central authorities that set fixed production amounts. Modern-day China is a good example of this. The Soviet Union was a bad example. What's the difference? Well, in the years following the Cuban Revolution, as an example, centralized planning looked to be paying dividends. Then came the lean years, or the special period as the Cubans called it, when centralized planning failed and their primary market collapsed with the fall of the Soviet Union. Some believe that you can have decentralized planning in terms of output and control over the means of production, but it's difficult to point to enduring examples of success. Now, students of economic and social theory will recognize our discussion thus far as pretty basic. But again, it's important to establish a common vocabulary and to frame inquiries in a way that contextualize the challenges different theories present in the real world. From here, we can build on the key concepts and terms such as labor, surplus, means of production, centralized planning, scarcity, and so on, to see how socialist theory was interpreted at different times through history. For the real aficionados, I promise that this will go deeper as we go. As a preview, we'll cover notable figures such as Cesar Beccaria, Jeremy Bentham, Henri de Saint-Simon, Robert Owen, Charles Fourier, Mikhail Bakunin, John Stuart Mill, John Dewey, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Peter Kropotkin, Karl Kautsky, Emma Goldman, right through to Michael Harrington and even Bernie. So thanks for jumping into the river with me. Hopefully when we emerge, we will indeed be different, as no doubt the river will be. Here endeth part one of Understanding Socialism.